sings, okay? So I have no idea how these things work. Although a student yesterday came up to me and he said, look, I found a picture of you on Snap. I said, what is Snap? Or Snapchat, okay? So show me the picture. And it was a picture of me shooting somebody else in the common room. <laughs> I, had a I bought a plastic gun for, it's, it's a long story, but <laughs> I'm recording videos, not these lecture videos, but for the Dutch Physical Society on gravitational waves. And I used a common room for a thing. And because of the narrative, I needed one of these plastic nerve guns, right? You need these things you can buy at the toy store. 20 euros or so, and for it will make sense if you see the video, but I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> carrying one of these things around. So apparently there's pictures of me shooting students online. <laughs> and I have no idea how that would reflect on people thinking about going to Maastricht. <laughs> <laughs> the lecturers shoot their students. Okay, um, promise you an overview. Let's get started. Um, so an overview of the whole series is going to be as follows. <coughs> So this is week one, maybe we have seven weeks to go. Week one is going to be, um, well, let's just call it an introduction. I'm going to talk to you about why relativity is important in physics. And I'm going to show you the way that it's typically demonstrated to you in books. It's called, by the beautiful German word, Gedanken Experiment. And yes, that word you also find in all other literature, no matter if it's German or not. It's, happens. it's a word that was borrowed and now it appears in literature on it. Um, uh, um, relativity. So I will show you how the books typically show how relativity is done. I will uh, repeat myself that this is not the narrative that is used in theoretical no. physics. Hi, welcome. Sorry. No, it's fine. Just take a seat. Um, so we will do this, but by week two, that's next week, I will explain you how it is done in physics. So I'm going to redrive everything that I'm going to do. I'm going to do in the next week in the way that we're actually going to do it from now on. So, by lack of better words, it's called <laughs> real relativity. And I will explain to you why this way is a very nice didactical way, but it comes with drawbacks. And these drawbacks you will encounter if you're going to do physics later on, theoretical physics. So this one I'm going to redo this then. And in week three, um, I will show you the paradoxes that appear in relativistic physics. Now you might already know a little bit about physics. physics. You might also know that it comes with paradoxes, things that seem to counteract itself. And the whole idea, really the big understanding of relativity comes from knowing how these paradoxes are resolved. So we're going to look at the paradoxes. And somewhere in the midst of these two, I'm going to explain something else to you, and that is how you do relativity purely graphically. This way, the real relativity is done in maths, but you can also do it in a graphic way, and both of them pay off. And I guess all of you are familiar with, if you do physics, like Newtonian physics, right, forces and such, you can do this by Newton's second law, F equals M times A and such. Um, but you could also do it in terms of graphs. Literally draw a graph of the mass and put some arrows, this is how much this is pulling, this is how much that is pulling. It gives you a new perspective. It gives you the same result, but in a very different way. And relatively, the same thing holds, so that's what I'm going to do as I go through these two topics. Now, week four is midterm. Midterm is exactly on these topics. Now, exactly what will be in the midterm is already specified, and I will tell you in these summaries I will send at the end of every lecture day exactly what it is that you need to have picked up. Okay? So don't worry, don't ask me right now, well, is this going to be in there, that going to be here? I know the answer, but it will also be online. Now, then we are in week five. Now, there's one beautiful thing about relativity, and that it is, allows you to do mechanics. What happens if you start pulling and pushing on things in a relativistic world? That gives you relativistic mechanics. And relativistic mechanics you can do in two ways. One is by saying, I'm also only going to look at things that are not being pushed against or pulled on. This is week five, uh, five. And in week six, I will do the same. Namely, if you do start pushing and pulling on things. For the people who are into normal mechanics, Newtonian mechanics, this will be the relativistic version of Newton's first law. And this will be the relativistic version of Newton's second law. So let's call this relativistic mechanics part two. By part two, I mean with forces. You start pulling on things. And this is without forces. 
and then finally we are at the end and the end of course is going to be your final and that's the uh, that's the schedule all right so there's that now let's make it a little bit interactive um, I've mentioned all kinds of words on relativity and or physics and we need to make sure that we all are start at the same starting point so let's do 10 minutes 50 minutes of um, interaction I would like to know what you know or think you know about relativity feel free to shout whatever I'm not going to say yes or no I'm just going to collect opinions and then we're going to see how much of this we will cover <coughs> and maybe that we really can answer a couple of these things. So don't be shy, all friends here. Einstein. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> sure. okay, let's, go. okay let's start with Einstein. Let's do that. Sure. All right. Well, it's a start. Yes, Einstein is related to physics. <laughs> okay. Okay. Something else. Um, constant light, speed of light. Constant? Uh, light, uh, the speed of light is uh, in the vacuum is always the same. Where, uh, no matter the referential. Okay, you're saying two separate things, and both of them are important. And this is exactly what we're doing. Is you say constant speed of light, and you also say it's the same value for everybody. Those are two separate separate statements, and I'm going to write down both of them because both of them are going to be important. So yes, there is something that has to do with the speed of light, and one that you mentioned is the constant speed of light and by constant we mean something like this that if you measure what the speed of light is now and you wait an hour or so you make it you measure that same speed of light you will find the same answer so it hasn't changed in time as it went along that's constant okay that's statement one you also made a second statement that is the same value for every observer mm -hmm. that's a different statement that's called an invariant the invariant speed of light. Do we all see this difference, by the way, between the two phrases? Can anybody call me, name me something that is constant? That is, if I measure it now and I wait a little while and I measure it again, I, I will find the same value. Speed of sound. Uh, the speed of sound will be a good example. Sure. Well, not if the sound happens to go from one medium to the next, yes? It starts in air and all of a sudden goes into water, then it has changed. But sure, if you keep to the same medium, speed of sound, same value. Uh, anything else? Mass. Mass, that's a good one. Uh, mass, yes. Well, yes and no. It depends on, <laughs> it, it, it depends on context. Uh, chemists typically talk about the conservation of mass. It's not conserved. Uh, but in their experiments, typically is. This is why I say it depends energy. on uh, energy. That is that is the prime example. That there is something that is called the law of conservation of energy. I'm sure you've all seen it in your high school years. If you measure the energy now of some system, measure the energy of the microphone. You measure how much energy is in there, and the number comes out four. And, the, and you, then you do all kinds of things to the microphone, right? You bump it off the table. You kick it around a couple of times. You set it on fire. You let it grow hairs. I mean, it doesn't matter. At some, you measure the energy again. The whole thing will have changed, but the number you will measure will still be four. That's a very deep law of physics. That's called. Uh, that's a constant. In fact, here I will prove to you the constancy of uh, energy. Now, you might have seen your high school years, I've seen books, high school books, where it says, well, this, this law cannot be proven, but uh, physicists have measured it so many times that they're convinced that it's true. You can prove this, and we will do it. Okay? And not by, well, we did some experiments. No, you can do the maths, and you will find that it comes out. By the time we have laid down these foundations, you just apply some maths to our these foundations, and you will find that uh, energy is indeed a conserved quantity, so we will prove that as we go along. Uh, anything else? Uh, invariant. Can somebody give you an example of an invariant? Well, speed of light is an example. Some other? I was thinking of the opposite. Like Something that is not invariant? Um, time. Time, when you measure time. Depending. That is very good. Uh, indeed, time is not an invariant. That is a very good point. That's exactly what we're going to talk to you uh, about today, of course. Is time invariant? So if one person measures that this lecture takes two hours, will the other person also measure that it takes two hours? And the answer is no. And I'm not talking about psychologically, that you really, really, really want to go out and, and, and get a pizza and check your snaps or something like that. <laughs> um, 
because if you I mean sure I mean if, if you're if you're sitting next to your beautiful beautiful girl on a bench or a boy whatever your preference is then the time seems to go very very quickly yet if you're at a very boring lecture it seems to take five hours or so but I mean if you would measure it would really just take an hour two hours now in old-fashioned physics before Einstein before relativity the idea was that everybody would measure the same duration of time if something takes two hours for one person it also takes two hours for the other person and it turns out, in relativity, this is not true. So in that terminology, uh, time used to be an invariant until relativity came along. And now it's not invariant in anymore. Um, another example of an invariant? The Minkowski line element. <laughs> okay. Uh, for people who don't know, Lizzie already followed the follow-up course. Two of them, in fact. No. Did, did you, which you did general relativity? Yeah. Okay. Not electrodynamics? Okay. She... she She's right, the Minkowski line element. If you don't know what that is, uh, see here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, she, she, uh, she, we are again, we are in the presence of greatness because Lizzie followed the course in general relativity without having done special relativity. It's not really necessary to No, because I introduced it there, but I'm not going to do it this year. <laughs> 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 because this has to do with this narrative that I said, that the original version of special relativity uh, didn't have to, I mean, it, it had the right content, but it had, didn't have the right way of presenting it to make sure that it really agreed with general relativity. Okay. So, so, but you already know this. And, but it's right, the Minkowski line element. And if you don't have no idea what it is, wait until we are here. Examples of invariance. If you have difficulty thinking about uh, an example, uh, you are right. There are very, very few invariants in nature. The speed of light is a famous example, and indeed the Minkowski line element is an example. Um, again, de depending on context, mass is an example. If I measure how many kilos, well, I put you on a scale, and it says, well, let's add 10 kilos of muscle there, so let's say that you're at 19 mm -hmm. kilos, okay? Nine zero kilos on that thing. And you measure what that number is, then the scale will tell you 90 kilos. Now, if some other observer will also measure your mass, he will also measure 90 kilos. Your mass will not all of a sudden change because somebody else happens to be looking at you. So mass is indeed also an example of an invariant. But that is about it. Speed of light, mass, and the Minkowski line element. And charge. there we are. What about electric charge? Then? Uh, th that is a very good point. That is, it is, at the very least, it's a constant, electric charge. So if you measure the amount of charge in the system now, and you do it, you do it sometime later, you will find that it is indeed constant. It has not changed in time. It might have redistributed itself amongst different subsystems, but it is still the same number. Is it invariant? And you make a very good point. And again, the answer is depending on context. If you just stick to normal quantum mechanics, the answer is yes. If you're going to add quantum mechanics to special relativity, a course that is called quantum field theory, and we do not offer that here yet, <laughs> then, <laughs> um, then you will find that it is uh, not an invariant, that you can add, add extra charges depending on situation, but sure. So that's about it. Chirality? Sorry? Chirality. Chirality, that is also a very nice one. A chirality is indeed also an invariant, yes. And I wonder where you picked up the word chirality. Nuclear physics. Uh, Jakob. From Jakob, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> yes. Every every time that, that you throw in quantum mechanics, because this is what he's doing, um, some of my uh, statements comes come with a little asterisk. They're not wrong, but they come with subtleties. So let's see how how many times Jaco's lectures are going to <laughs> serve my lecture. No, if if you do find that that. Um, I'm saying things so you have trouble reconciling it with uh, quantum mechanics and particle physics. Do tell me, because these things are usually easily resolved. Okay, but you're right. Chirality is one. And if you have no idea what chirality is, follow Jakob's course. It has to do with how much spin a particle has uh, with respect to what direction it is moving. Anyway. Okay, let's uh, continue. So we have some examples of the constancies, invariances, uh, general ideas on relativity points of view points of view um, i know exactly what you mean i'm just going to rephrase it uh, reference frames yes. mm. okay and a reference frame what is that by the way do you know <coughs> uh, the, uh, I mean, it's a really it's a really subtle definition i guess no that is very true yes 
could be a lot <coughs> and it could be nothing. Like in certain cases, a system could be a reference frame, mm -hmm. and in others, could be like the analyze system. So you could be outside of it. You can consider yourself inside of it. Okay, it's really complicated. It 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 is indeed a very subtle point. Reference frame has something to do uh, in what coordinate system you are measuring your positions and your moments in time, and. It is exactly at the heart of relativity that you will find that one person in one reference frame measures different numbers for these quantities than a guy in another reference frame. A very good example is, well, let's do it right here, right now. Uh, you measure how much time it will take for this pen to drop to the floor, and you say it's 0.6 seconds or so. Um, if I were to do the same experiment now, you will measure a different number. It's not because I dropped it in a different way or because gravity has moved in a different way, but simply because when I first did it, you and I were in the same reference frame. We could use the same axis. Yet when I was moving, I had a moving reference frame, whereas your reference frame was still stuck to the floor. And that makes differences in your measurements. And what these differences are is exactly at the heart of relativity. This is what we're going to discuss today. More examples. Any phrase on relativity? Yes, go ahead. Uh, time dilation and length. There we go. Time dilation and length contraction. I didn't hear, but I'm sure you length said length contraction. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you know what they are? Can it's you tell like me? If we start, if we're nearing or at the speed of light, yes. then uh, time is different relative to someone at lower speeds. So time seems to be shorter and length also. Okay. It's the other way around. Time is. Takes it's, um, like, okay. Yeah, but it depends on which side you are, right? I, I can smell a paradox here. Can you? <laughs> <laughs> she says it's not, it becomes shorter and she says, no, 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 it depends on such and such. So we no, like come in. She was saying it's shorter for someone who's not traveling in the speed of light. Yes. So it's like longer yeah. if you're at the speed of light. So uh, it's the same thing depending on which side you are. It really depends on right? point of view you have. Okay. Well, this, of course, everything deals with these reference frames. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, also. if a certain duration or a certain length, a distance, how much that is, indeed, depends on your reference frame. And how that depends on each other, that is, of course, exactly what we're going to talk to you about today. Anything else? So you're right. We're going to talk about this. So yes. If a reference frame is going at the uh, speed of light, Yes. then you can't add, like, you can't go faster than the speed of light. Okay, so I hear a new statement here. You cannot go faster than the speed of light. And, yeah. uh, like, so, for example, you're on an object that goes yeah. at the speed of light, and you're moving in the same direction. You're not, you will not go faster. You'll still be at the speed of light, even if you're going, if you're, if you're moving on an object that's going at the speed of light. So you're saying that when you go with the speed of light, then... Like, for example, you have, I don't know, a sh uh, space... Yes. and it's going at the speed of light and then you're moving in the in the direction that your spacecraft is moving yes with some speed yes but you will still be going at the speed of light even if you kind of have to add your speed to the speed of light all right no you're very you're very right in fact that is this statement yeah. because you're saying well uh did you say spaceship yeah, or whatever. Sure, let's take a spaceship. A spaceship is going close to the speed of light. And I see the spaceship fly by and I measure how fast it is going. I will measure a particular value. And you said that it went exactly with the speed of light? For Yeah, I mean, I mean it can't go, but like... Well, let's take that as an example. Let's replace the speed of light or the spaceship by an actual ray of light. Okay? Yeah, okay. So we'll actually go with the, with the speed of light. So I see a flash of light go by. And then I measure how many meters it has traveled in how many seconds. It gives me a certain value. That's the speed of light. And now the same ray of light flies by, and I start following it. Okay. okay? Yeah. And I do really, really my best to keep, to keep up with it. Probably won't make it, but to try my best. Then you would say that, well, the amount of meters that the thing has distanced itself from me is less now in a certain amount of seconds. So I would think that, well, apparently then, the speed of light as seen by the guy who's trying to run along with it is a smaller number. Yet you will find it is actually the same number. Uh, in fact, this is how you connect this, because I went to a different reference frame. I went to a, the reference frame that moved along with the speed of light. Yet the speed of light has to be an invariant, so it has to come out the same number. 
Now, if speed is the amount of distance divided by the amount of time, and it has traveled less distance, according to the guy who's trying to run along, but the same number has to come out. Let me put this in mathematics for a second. So, the you amount of distance, the distance that I see, the sorry, what's that? Change the distance. Uh, to change the distance. This number has to come out the same. That is his statement. Um, yet this number is actually smaller because the thing has traveled less distance. Then something must have happened to time in order to make the number come out the same, yes? Bigger. Mm -hmm. Okay, bigger. bigger. So there you go, there's your time dilation. So you can already see that these things are connected to each other. Anything else? I'm missing a couple of phrases. Maxwell's equations. Oh wow, oh, ooh. okay, <laughs> look at that. I'm now sincerely hoping that in period four you will follow electrodynamics with me, so we can discuss this in full detail. Maxwell's equation, so what are the Maxwell's equations? Um, they are the fundamentals of electromagnetism. Okay. Um, and I don't want to say something wrong, but if I remember correctly... Go, go, please say something wrong. If I remember wrong. correctly, yes. um, according to classical physics, yes. uh, Maxwell's equations have some paradoxes, uh, especially regarding to time and to reference frames, mm -hmm. and relativity came in um, to unify, let's say. That is very correct. Nothing wrong there. In fact, that's going to be my starting point in a moment when we're really, really going to start the Maxwell's equations. So very good. Um, anything else? Um, celestial, like celestial mechanics. Uh, uh, so things moving through space? Yeah, uh, and maybe like that there is a difference between like it doesn't it only apply like on a macroscopic scale, and like it doesn't work like for quantum physics. It's too different. Okay, um, uh, there there's two statements again. Uh, one of them is celestial mechanics. How do things look as viewed from Earth? Very true. Uh, there is relativity there in at least two ways. There's an apparent motion and there's an actual motion and that has to do something with relativity. Okay. Then there's a second statement, um, namely general relativity. We have time dilation here, right? Things might take longer or more seconds or less seconds depending on reference frame. Um, that also happens due to gravity. Gravity will also make time flow differently. And you have to take that into account if you do celestial mechanics. You're standing on Earth, measuring what's happening there. You have to take into account that what you're seeing there has been relative due to gravity. Now that part, of course, is general relativity, the 3006 course of period five. Uh, but yes, there is relativity there. Now let me add something myself. Um, how about energy, mass, momentum? Phrases from your basic physics. Does anyone happen to know an equation about energy in relativity? Yeah. Something like this? But you need to add... Mm -hmm. What's that? You need to add the momentum um, term to the energy. That's one. I've never seen this. Uh, that's here. And momentum. So the amount of motion that something has. And these things are all connected to each other, just as they are Newtonian mechanics, just in a very different way. I think this is about it, unless somebody feels that there should be added something here. Maybe the Galileo transformation, sure. the Lorentz transformation. Okay. Oh, that's very good. Okay. Uh, it's part of the reference. The Lorentz transformations. So, what do these say? Do we know? Uh, you use them. Uh, it's uh, for um, transform transformation of coordinates yes. from one system to another. That is very true. Uh, and also the time. You change the time. That is very true. That's a very good point. Um, the Lorentz transformations. If you've never heard about these things, of course, we're going also going to derive these. This is what we're going to do here in lecture two. But already to give some background. The Lorentz transformations are indeed a way to calculate if you know how much time and or space was in one guy's reference system, how much is there in the other guy's reference system. Mm -hmm. They're related to each other. 
and how you calculate from one to the next. If you know that my lecture, as seen by me, took two hours, how much time did it take for the other guy? You use the Lorentz transforms. But wait, how is the difference from different from time dilation? Because didn't time dilation tell you the same information? That if one person looks at something, it takes so long, and if the other person takes longer or shorter? What do you mean by that? That um, you say that you can use these yeah. to calculate uh, the differences in durations mm -hmm. and distances from one reference system to the next, yeah. whereas these two already did that for you. Yeah. So we, it's to change also uh, the reference. Frame. Exactly. Uh, to but be able to, like, if there is two different reference frames, yes. it's to s switch, let's say, to one. From reference frame to reference frame. Yeah, but these already do that for you as well. Th there is a difference there. It's subtle, but we, we will get there. Okay. okay? Um, I think this is really it. Maybe yeah. causality and light codes? Or? Uh, that is actually, yeah, sure, let's put that in there as well. That is very true. Causality and light cones. And these, of course, I will explain when I talk about the graphical way of explaining these things. But we're now at the point where we're really just reiterating the same information in different terminology. I think we are sort of exhausted in the topics now. Okay? Now, who of you already have some background in relativity? Yeah? Ish. <laughs> All right, so well, I propose we get started. I'm going to leave this up for a moment because I'm going to try to connect a couple of these things to each other. And I already promised that the starting point was already mentioned is indeed the Maxwell equation. So consider this some sort of a historical introduction. Uh, we are going to go back to the 90, excuse me, the 1800s, so it's the 19th century. Now physics was in a very good state, uh, namely uh, people had figured out how you can calculate how masses move. This was Newton's laws. And people also by that time had figured out how electromagnetism worked. Now originally, so back in ancient times, people already figured out that if you pet a cat, then your hair will stand up, okay? And that if you <laughs> would stroke a comb, and you could pick up pieces of, of, of snippets of paper. And, and people slowly figured out by experiment what the laws are that govern these effects, right? This is, this is uh, the electricity. And quite irrespectively of this, people found out that there are pieces of ore that you can just pick up from the ground, stone, and they happen to randomly attract other pieces of stone and or metal, right? This is called magnetism. These two things, we are now very used to knowing that these things are connected to each other. They didn't. There was electricity, there was magnetism. They seem to have something in common because they could both attract and repel, but the laws by which they attract and repel are very different. So these, what we're talking about now is the Maxwell's equations. One Maxwell equation tells you how to magnetically charged, it's not exactly the right terminology, but let's stick to it for a moment. If you have two of these orbs, how much they will attract or repel each other. And people had also found out, that's one other of the Maxwell equations, that if you take one electrically charged <coughs> particle and you take another one, that you can also calculate how much those will attract and repel each mm. other. Two laws, one for elect electricity, one for magnetism. Both tell you something about repelling and attraction. But apart from this overall scheme of being able to attract and repel each other, they had very little in common. And then, 19th century, people found out that these two effects were related. You can turn something that has an electrical repulsion or attraction into something that has a magnetic uh, uh, repulsion or attraction. Now how that worked was worked out mathematically by, amongst other people, Maxwell, but he, shared, <laughs> he found the missing piece and then all of a sudden all, all these laws were named after him. Um, <laughs> so yeah, such is, such is life. Um, he found that these, that these uh, this electric, uh, electricity and magnetism are related to each other and there were two more equations. And these two extra equations tell you how electricity and magnetism are influenced by each other. So that gives you a total of four equations. One for electricity, one for magnetism, and two that relate them to each other. Now, being able to mathematically manipulate these four equations is a whole course by itself. It's called <laughs> electrodynamics in period five. Uh, excuse me, period four. Um, so let's not go into 
too much detail there, but I'm going to say this. Maxwell, the scientist, found out that if you have a piece of charge, electric charge, and you know how to turn it into a little piece of magnetism, that piece of magnetism itself can be turned back into a piece of charge. And he found that you can make this go back and forth and back and forth. Let's be very specific here. If I hold a magnet here, this is not a magnet, but you know what I mean. I hold a magnet up and I shake it in exactly the right way. Then one of the laws of Maxwell's equations tell me that it will behave as if I'm shaking about not a magnet, but an electric charge. So shaking this thing, a magnet has the same effect as if I would have shaken something electric. But shaking something electric, that's another of Maxwell's equations, tell you that it behaves as if you were shaking something magnetic. So I shake something magnetic, it behaves as if it is uh, electric, but because we're shaking, that behaves again like something magnetic, back to electric, magnetic, electric, magnetic, back forth, back forth, back forth. If you do the maths, you will find that this back and forth and back and forth moves through space with a certain velocity. And Maxwell's equations actually tell you what that velocity is. You don't have to put it in, you don't have to measure it, it comes out of the mass. And it turned out to be uh, this number. 2998 10 to the power 8 meter per second. So you just do the maths, this came out. And I guess we all recognize this as the speed of light. Now this was an enormous, enormous historical uh, surprise. Because people had already known about light and its high speed, this number, had no idea where it came from. They knew how it behaved, what it would do if you put it through a lens. This is, of course, in optics. Had no idea what it was. Now, completely from a completely different angle, people had been stroking cats and had their hand, a hair stand up. <laughs> and people had been playing around with orbs and pieces of metal and saw that they attracted. Maxwell found out, again, among with other people, that they were related. And now, all of a sudden, light came out of this mass. So where you started out with three separate quantities, separate entities, electro electricity, magnetism, and light, all of a sudden they were all connected. Now, that by itself is a beautiful piece where you see that all of physics is related to each other. And I, I'm sure that Jaco will tell you that electromagnetism itself comes directly from quantum mechanics. If you're quantum mechanics... Well, the quantum mechanics causes this period, so you will probably tell us. I think so. Um, <laughs> if uh, I gave the course in nuclear physics last year because Jakob wasn't around yet and I put that in it's it's a hard piece of math but you will find if you take your Dirac equation mm. um, and you manipulate it mathematically in the right way you will get Maxwell's equations out so all of a sudden everything boils back to quantum mechanics including all this stuff and light now back to our story um, mid 19th century Maxwell found this number and then he deduced that apparently light is an electromagnetic interaction something that moves through space with the speed of light mm -hmm. okay again how this exactly works is of course by itself but for now we just take it as a fact and then maxwell wrote down the beautiful words that he could scarcely go around the conclusion that apparently light was nothing else but electromagnetic interaction moving through space that is a huge huge conclusion but here's where the theoretical interesting part comes in this number that comes out doesn't require you to specify how fast you yourself were moving while looking at this electromagnetic shaking of things. This number came out regardless. Typically, if you do your physics, say Newtonian mechanics, what you have to do is you have to say, well, this is my reference frame. I'm looking at this thing moving through my reference frame, and now I know how many meters it, 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 it goes per how many seconds. And it turns out that the shaking of electromagnetism, what we now know is light, came out with this number without you having to have specified how fast you yourself were moving with respect to that light. It just comes out of the maths. Now that is very strange. Because is there, is, if there's one thing that you know about speed, is that you can change it, yes? Mm. If something is moving with a certain velocity and you want it to move a little bit less with respect to you, you start running along with it. If you want it to move a little bit faster, you start moving away from it. And all of a sudden, Maxwell's equation tells you, nope, not for light. Whatever you do, you never have to specify how fast you're moving. You will always find this number. Now, by now, we call this number C. 
I'm sure there's somebody who knows more about Greek and or Latin than I do, but I think it stands for some Greek or ancient word for, for speed or something like that, or very fast. Does anyone know? Because I've always been dying to know. I never bothered to pick up a book. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I have on relativity, but just not on, on, the, on, on the words. Isn't it uh, C for constant? No, it, it, it is something like celeritas or something like that. Ah, uh, yeah, so, yeah, it means velocity. Okay, there you go. In what language? Greek. Oh, okay, there you go. Okay, thank you. So, okay, we've le already learned something today, okay? Thank you. And I have too. Not being sarcastic. Yes, this is where the C stands for. Um, so this is very important because it means that apparently light is indeed an invariant. Now, people, when they found this, were not uh, ready to accept that as a thing. Because, as we already saw very briefly just now, that if this number should equal to C, and you can manipulate this number by going from one reference frame to the next, then this number must uh, change accordingly. Yeah. That means all of a sudden durations of time are going to be very different from one reference frame to the next. Now, people were not, uh, were not ready to accept that as a fact. And you know how that goes in, 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 in uh, scientific philosophy, yes? Uh, at first, there is one piece of evidence that tells you that maybe you should conclude something. And then Popper would say, oh, well, that means you have to accept that. No, that's not how it works. I think about your liberal arts and sciences course, okay? Because at some point, somebody will come along and say, I have another piece of evidence. And I have another one. And at some point, it has piled up so much that Thomas Kuhn will come along and say, well, at this point, you should have a paradigm shift. And now you should go and accept another piece of physics, another starting point. And Einstein was famously the person who made that, f that paradigm shift. He said, you know what? Let's accept this as fact. It just so happens that light has the same velocity regardless of how fast you yourself are moving with respect to the light. Regardless of your value of your reference frame. Um, and Einstein, famously in 1905, made this, as we call this, a postulate. A postulate is just a starting point of your physical theory that by itself you don't require evidence for. You just say, you know what, I'm just going to take this as my starting point. And Experiment apparently tells you that this is true, and then from that I'm just going to build. In math you would call this an axiom. Einstein in 1905 made two of these axioms. Now, my plan for today is, going to, is, is, is that I'm going to take his two axioms, build special relativity out of that, and the next week I will tell you that you can do away with Einstein's postulates and still find special relativity. This is what I meant when I said this is real relativity. Okay, so here's our first postulate. <coughs> so let's call them Einstein's postulates as opposed to how I will call this next week the Minkowski postulates. But this is how Einstein did it classically. Einstein's postulates. He said, well, based on this whole Maxwell equation business, postulate number one is the speed of light. is, and let's use this terminology, is invariant. You might find when talking to people that you accidentally use the word constant. Constant is a different thing than invariance, yes? Constant, again, means you measure it now, you measure it the next second, that hasn't changed in between. Now, it just so happens that light is an invariant and it is a constant, but what you mean is invariance here. The speed of light is invariant. That's one. And he made a second postulate. Does anyone know what it is, by the way? The laws the of physics are the same in its reference frame or something like that. Okay. Uh, there were some people who put their hand up that they had already seen some relativity. Um, speed of light, uh, the laws of physics are the same regardless of reference, reference frame, frame, something like that? Yeah. Okay. We call this the postulate of relativity. So, uh, Now, what does that mean? And you're exactly right, but it's hard to phrase this in a very, very good and, and, and clear manner. It means that the laws of physics are not, and this is where I'm going to differ from your terminology, but I'm sure you mean it's right, but it's, 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 it's a phrasing that is important. It means that the laws of physics, not, as you say, are the same in every, in every uh, reference frame, because they're not. If I'm going to measure the speed of sound, and I'm going to move, I'm going to go to another reference frame, and I chase the, the, the sound wave around, it will give me different numbers. Okay? 
So things will change from reference frame to reference frame. What will not change though is the law that these numbers obey. Do you see the difference there? I will give you an example in a moment if that's, if that's not clear to you. Let me write it down first. So the relativity postulate, I'm not going to explain this one any further, this should be clear. The relativity postulate means that the laws of physics should be the same in all reference frames. And again, I don't mean that the numbers are the same if you go from one reference frame to the next. I mean that the, the, the laws that these numbers obey remain the same. What's that? The structure? How they like yeah, li literally the mathematical structure. When we're going to do relativity later on, and uh, well, I already raised it, but this, this overview that I gave, we're going to do some relativity applied to different situations, for instance, mechanics. The only way that Einstein says that it is correct is if we write down our mathematics such that these formulas have the same structure regardless what reference frame you are. Now, this again comes from Maxwell's equations. Does anyone know where the second one comes from? Why did it take the second postulate? Is it an axiom? Well, it is. An axiom in physics we call a, uh, a postulate. So, but it, it was inspired by something. Just as this postulate was inspired by Maxwell's equations, the other one also is inspired by something. And if you don't know, that's fine. Galileo? Sorry? Galileo? At Galileo. Because he was... Yes. He, he, there is also like uh, Galileo's... Transforms. Exactly. Yes. Uh, yeah, there is some truth in there. Yes. Uh, let me, me, you're right. Well, let, let me... Let me put that aside for a moment. Um, there is no real reason to believe that, that, it, that it is true. There's no experiment that tells that it's true. Well, sure, I mean, if you take it as a positive and you work out the laws of physics and you test these laws of physics, you find that they work. So apparently it's the right assumption. But beforehand, a priori, there's no real reason to think that this is a true postulate. But then again, suppose that it isn't true. That will mean that if I would take, say, Maxwell's equations, and I look at some electromagnetism here, and I do my calculations, the Maxwell's equations give me the right number. Okay? Now I'm going to look at the exact same situation, but right now I'm in a different reference system. Look, I'm now moving with respect to that piece of electromagnetism, and now I try to use my Maxwell's equations. Would you expect my laws to come out different? My predictions to come out different? Do you think that electromagnetism, mag magnetism, cares about whether I as an observer happen to be walking with respect to it. Do you see what I mean here? I mean, would you expect physics, nature itself, to have a preference for you uh, looking at it while you're walking or while you're not walking, while you're moving with respect to it or not moving with, res with respect to it? It's independent of the observer. Sorry? Independency uh, from the observer. That's exactly, that's a different phrasing of the same thing. It should be independent of the observer. Otherwise, you're assuming apparently that nature has a preference. He, nature, he, I mean, nature is typically a she in my mind, she cares about whether you happen to be moving or not when you look at her. Okay? Um, you might say, well, maybe that is true. Or maybe it's not true. And it feels, but it's more philosophy than it is science, it feels that there's something wrong with her. Why would nature care? And this is Einstein's postulate. He said, well, let's, let's, let's suppose that, that she doesn't care. It's interesting if you talk to, yes? Just conceptually, an observer, yes. would you define that as a conscious being, or could it also be? <laughs> I feel some philosophy uh, around the corner here. That, that's some quantum stuff. Um, uh, no, I would leave consciousness out of it. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a human being doing the observing. No, but I mean, could it be a camera? Just a stone sure, yeah, yeah, it could be a stone, a stone, stone, sure, absolutely. We do these kinds of calculations. We say, well, from the stone, it looks like such and such, and we would not argue that the stone itself has a conscience or something like that. And no, the, 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 the human spirit has nothing to do with this. I mean, Einstein really assumed, well, the laws of physics really don't care about whether you happen to be looking at things while moving or not, or when stones are looking at it or not. Now, if you ask a high school student, and you say, how fast is the train moving? He will say, oh, look, it goes to 80 kilometers per hour. And I say, oh, 
He said, really? And they said, yeah, compared to the ground. I said, well, that is true. But how about compared to the sun? Because the Earth itself is orbiting the sun, so that means, as seen from the sun, the train will have a different velocity. Agreed? Mm -hmm. And then a, high school student, a typical high school student would say, yeah, but you have to measure things from, from, the, from the ground, otherwise it doesn't work. <laughs> okay? That's exactly what I mean. Einstein says, no, no, no. You don't, you, you, you're not allowed to specify you can only use this law compared to the Earth, say. You should also be allowed to use it from the sun. There's no reason why nature wants you to only measure things from the Earth, or from the sun, or from anything else from that matter. And if you leave out <coughs> that um, idea that there are preferred reference frames, reference frames from which you're only allowed to do your physics, then, well, then, then, you, then you, you're not allowed to use your physics from any other point. And then, of course, the question comes along, okay, then which of all these reference frames is the correct one? Okay, and I said none of them are. All of them are fine. That's the second postulate. Now, back to history, when people found uh, the invariance of the speed of light, they thought, uh, well, one way to resolve that, that everybody measures the same speed of light, is by assuming that Maxwell's equations are only allowed to be used from one reference frame and not the next. So two people might get, get the same number for the speed of light, but one of them is simply wrong. He was not allowed to use the, the laws of uh, Maxwell in the first place. And Einstein said, no, no, no. Everybody is allowed to use that. And that's the second postulate. That's where we are. All right. All clear so far? Because these are the postulates that we now have in 1905. We're now going to build some actual physics out of that. How are we on time? All right, give me a couple of minutes. So we sort of checked off a couple of these things, yes? The invariance of speed of light, Maxwell. Um, we talked about reference frames. It simply means moving or not with respect to the thing that you happen to be observing. Maxwell's equations. Um, and, well, it's also constant. Now, this we will do today. And uh, that it is the maximum velocity we will do in two weeks from now. And the energy part, the momentum part, will come in week five and six when we're going to talk about mechanics. This is going to be our build-up. And then we have everything collected together. Right. So, let's get started. Now, I promised you we're first going to derive things simply by taking the historical route, and that is how Einstein himself did that. You know what? Let's do it as follows. Let me take my five uh, minutes before the break to give you a slightly extra piece of uh, historical information. Uh, you all know the story of Einstein, yes? That he got his degree in physics from the Polytechnical School in Zurich, in uh, Switzerland. He wasn't Swiss, he was German, but he was an, an extreme pacifist. Uh, and in Germany, back in the day, you had to go uh, to the army if you lived there and it turned 18 or so, and he didn't want to. He said, well, even, even in, in peacetime, I don't want to be in armies. Um, so he renounced his, uh, uh, me, he renounced his um, German citizenship and moved to Switzerland. There he went to school, and nobody wanted to have him when he had his degree. Nobody wanted to have him as a researcher. So he applied to many universities. Can it be a, either a lecturer or a researcher? Said, no, 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 no. You're, you're, you're just not good enough. Now, to be sure, Einstein was good at physics. His report cards tell you that he was good at mm -hmm. physics. There is this. This, this, this crappy story going around that Einstein was very bad at mathematics. He wasn't, okay? You can actually look up his report cards and he just had high marks in that as well. What is consistent is people said he was lazy. He didn't want to work. So sometimes he didn't even come to class because he had a friend whose name was Besso and he just asked him for his notes and then studied from there and then he got high grades for everything. But nobody wanted him as a researcher or a lecturer. So, um, he decided to just uh, 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 tutor high school students for a while. And then his friend, again the same guy, Besso, got him a job at the patent office. Right? This is probably something you've heard before. Uh, patent office means you actually sit there and, dis and, and decide whether something could be patented and then be sold and have all the legal rights and such. Uh, he was extremely bored, so what he did was, in his free time, did some physics. In 1905 he wrote uh, a number of papers. It's called his, his miracle year, because all four papers are Nobel Prize worthy. He did that in his free time while working another job. Okay, I have difficulty in a lifetime coming up with something that is half Nobel Prize worthy. 
let alone if I have, if I have nothing else to do, <laughs> if I would have something else to do. So he did it in his, in his spare time. One paper was exactly on what we're going to do today. These Gedanken experiments, these things that tell you how Lorentz transforms work and such. One other is about the uh, existence of atoms. Chemists had the very big suspicion that things were made out of atoms and were bouncing into each other, but nobody really knew how to put it into experiment. You can really just do a test and then find that it is true. And Einstein wrote a paper on that. And when the experiment was done, it was it agreed completely with Einstein. So he proved that atoms were not just a mere hypothesis, it's actually a, an existing reality. Uh, another paper is on E's MC squared. And then there's a final paper. And I'm blanking on it right now. Thank you, photoelectric effect. This is what he actually got the Nobel Prize for. The idea that that idea was not his, that particles come in lumps, photons, light. And uh, again, that was completely against any, anything else. And he took it seriously. The idea came from Planck. And he took it seriously and proved a number of things, including the photoelectric effect. Now, Einstein won the Nobel Prize in 1921, but not for relativity and or the other papers, but for the photoelectric effect. And when I did my PhD at NICEF, the Institute for Nuclear Physics, um, we had a lecturer coming by who was a lady from the Nobel Prize Committee. And she gave a lecture on why Einstein was not given his Nobel Prize for Relativity. And that was because it had already been tested many times over, 15 years later or so. But they were afraid, the Nobel Prize Committee, that it might be wrong after all. And how stupid would it look if you give somebody a Nobel Prize and then it turns out that it was not right? This is how radical these ideas are, that time is not absolute, that time depends on your reference frame. That time is not an invariant. Um, so they said, you know what, we should get a Nobel Prize because everything seems to be coming out correctly if you compare it to predictions. <laughs> so they, they, they gave him the Nobel Prize for his services for, to theoretical physics. Usually you say you get it because you found this formula or you found this effect or the such and the such. And by services to theoretical physics, they meant relativity but they didn't want to specify it in detail. So in case, if somebody found that relativity was not true uh, at all, all right? I mean, after all, it was, it was a crappy theory, then this could still say, well, theoretical physics, we meant, we meant the atom sink. <laughs> one, of, one of the other ones. But we now know that relativity is the cornerstone all of all of physics. Okay, so uh, let's have a break. And after break, let's derive some stuff. <laughs> All right, everybody. Let's put some of conceptual understanding into maths. Are there any questions, by the way, on the historical introduction and or the meaning of the words that we've discussed? All clear? Good. So, um, Let's go back to 1905. Einstein, in his one paper, where he derived these results, um, used to uh, thought experiments. He German Gedanken Experimenten. And the Gedanken Experimenten, again, it's a word that you will now find ubiquitously in literature on, on uh, high. Um, it's fine. In, on relativity. Um, let's go through these two Gedanken Experimenten that he did. Derive the results. And then we're pretty much done already. I mean, then we have special relativity. But then we're going to discuss why in theoretical physics we decide to do it differently and then we take on next week, okay? So here are the two Gedanken experimenten that Einstein came up with. He introduced two reference frames. Um, one reference frame is a guy standing on a train. Yes, you will find trains in all literature on relativity. <laughs> And why? It's because Einstein came up with this example, so everybody has taken that example since. So let's do it as well. Here's a train card. And what I want you to envision is that somebody made a reference frame out of this thing. He actually drew a coordinate system on the floor of the train. So imagine somebody stepping on a train, taking a bucket of paint with him and putting on the ground a big one and one meter and then with a two and a three and a four. So you get a reference frame. One, two, three, four. The numbers are not very important. There's one reference frame. Some system from which you can measure positions and distances. So let's call this the cart frame. And then Einstein said, you know what? Let's do a separate coordinate frame. I'm going to draw that in red for clarity. 
the separate coordinate frame is going to be uh, the track. So let's call that the track frame. And you can play the same game there. You can say, well, let's make a coordinate system out of that. So you take your bucket of paint, we'll take red paint in this, in this case, uh, stand next to the track, draw one on the floor, draw two or three or four, etc. So we also have a coordinate system here. Now, because we're going to talk about space and time, we also have to take into account that you can measure time uh, in the cart and you can measure time um, over here on the track. So you can take a watch with you. But Einstein here is the clear idea, said, you know what? Let's make a clock that operates on the basis of light being sent from one place to the next. So what he envisioned was, let's take a light bulb More like a balloon. Okay, try again. Feel free to do this better in your notes, okay? Let's take a light bulb, put it in the center of the cart, and let's place a mirror exactly above the light bulb. And the idea is we're going to send a flash of light, and let's make the light flash blue for clarity's sake. Let's take a flash of light. Send it upward, then let it go downward, so it bounces against the mirror, gets reflected and gets back here. And suppose that, aside from sending out the light that the lamp does, it also um, uh, uh, detects light. Okay, So you can tell when the light has come back. Of course, it's going to take an enormously small amount, because that number that we had here, the speed of light is very big. But let's suppose, it's a Duncan experiment, let's suppose he can easily measure this without any error. Okay, Now... Um, this, if you will, is a clock. Really, the only thing that you need in order to measure time is some process. And you call the beginning of the process, you call now, and the end of the process, you, you, you call a certain amount of time later, and that amount of time in between, you call, you give it, that, that's your unit, that's your unit of time. This is very much the same as looking at an actual clock, as in with these big hands and the small hands, and you say, you know, now, now is now, and then something happens and the hand is over here and that amount of time we call a second. Mm -hmm. It's just a measure of time. You're free to choose whatever measure of time. But Eisen chose this one. And he did that for a reason. He says, well, this unit of time from this moment that is sent out the light and it's back is going to be our unit of time. And we're going, we can call it a second if you want or whatever. Some unit of time. Let's, let's give that unit of time a name. And I am going to call it in black, because I'm measuring it from the black system. I call this amount of time for this process to occur from here back. Let's call it delta t card. Some number comes out. Okay. Now, uh, just for notation's sake, do you understand why I put the, 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 a delta there and not a t? Duration. It's a duration, exactly. It's not a moment in time, it's a duration. And sometimes people are a little bit sloppy in, in their notation. When you mean a time, an actual moment in time, this is a t. If you mean the duration, then you mean delta t. Now, one thing about relativity, it's, it's, it's a theory about durations and distances. It is not a theory about moments in time and locations in space. It's only a theory about deltas. Okay, so I'm going to write everything with delta. This you do not always see in books. That's just sloppy notation. Everybody means well, but you have to be clear. So I'm just going to call this delta. Now suppose that the height of the card is L. And first postulate by Einstein. The velocity with which the light goes up and goes down is C, this one particular number. Then what is the amount of time that you will measure? How much is delta T card? CL. What's that? CL? Yeah, C times L. Um, you're almost right. So it's, it's divided, yes? Oh, no, you're right. I mean, a distance would be velocity times time, or duration here. Mm -hmm. I'm being sloppy myself now. Um, twice. And yeah, then twice, twice, because it has to go up and it has to go yeah. down. So you would expect this number to pop up if you do your time measurement. This is your unit of time. Mm -hmm. Now, this is all very clear, yes? This is what you would measure if you were on board of this particular reference frame. Now we're going to make things interesting. We're going to give that reference frame, the black reference frame, a velocity with respect to the track. The velocity, say in this direction, 
And for now, we're going to take a constant velocity. That velocity we're going to call V. No Greek needed there. That really just stands for velocity, I would think. <laughs> um, any idea why I would draw that velocity, that V, with red? Because it's the speed regarding that. Yeah, with respect to the track, yes. I, mean, I know what, what the velocity of the cart is <coughs> with respect to the cart. It's zero. The cart is not moving with respect to the cart. So there's V. And the idea now is, now let's take some other guy who is in the track frame and he's also looking at the same phenomenon. This light being sent out by the bulb and going back to the bulb, how much time would that take as measured by the other guy? And now something interesting happens. Let's draw what happens. So as seen from the track, at the moment that this light is being sent upward, um, it will not hit the mirror anymore, will it? Because the, <coughs> the train will have moved a certain amount. Mm. And, well, that sucks. So does light still bounce back? Depends yeah. on the speed. Well, and how big the mirror is, yes? If the mirror is yeah, about this yeah. size, <laughs> sure. Yes, light that. doesn't move in a straight way. Exactly, yeah. thank you. That's what we need. Listen, what I did in this particular example is I, of, of, this light, as you say, goes in all directions, yes? Yeah. And I, all, all, all these light rays, I only took the one that went to the mirror. I could have taken any of the ones, mm -hmm. but this is the easiest to calculate the numbers. I took this one. Right? But sure, uh, there's also, also one that is sent out in this way. Agreed? Mm -hmm. Now that one will hit the mirror uh, when the mirror has moved a little, a, a certain amount. Okay, let's follow that one. Do you agree with me that, um, let's make a little bit of drawing here. Do you agree with me that your light ray is going to find the mirror, sent in that direction that it will find the mirror and bounce off of that? Will go in this direction, as seen from the track. Okay. Then it will hit the mirror. It will bounce back. I hope you understand that if this is a constant velocity, then uh, this angle will be that angle, it will be the same thing, yes? Okay. This is why I say let's take a constant velocity. You don't have to, by the way. But for clarity's sake, let's suppose that it is. Then it will find the bulb again, which by that time has moved here. So let's be very clear here. What I mean by this light bulb is where the light bulb was at the moment that the light ray was sent out. This is where the mirror is at the moment that the light ray has found the mirror. And the car keeps on going. And this is the, li the light bulb where it is at the moment that it has gone back. <coughs> Picture clear? Okay, let's calculate how much time that would take. So it's the same process, isn't it? It's the same clock that you're looking at. Remember, we introduce this as a means of a clock. You can measure how much time has passed. We're looking at the same process here. Now, what would you expect to come out if this was non-relativistic physics? Some guy says, look, it took me one second to see the light go back to my light bulb. What would you expect that the other guy says if it was non-relativistic physics? The same. The same, the same, the same second, same, yes? Yeah. Okay. Um, we will find that that is not the case. You look confused, Jeff. Mm. No. Okay, yeah. good. <laughs> I mean, I'm confused, but well, about I what? think we will figure it out. Okay, if you see out confusion, do let me know. Yes. yes. Is it in the picture? No, no, the picture is on the center. Okay. Uh, let me go through it. If you still have a yep. question, let's see what happens. Okay. Now, it is certainly true that you would expect the same number to come out, yes? I mean, if this lecture takes two hours, then the other guy moving with, uh, with respect to this lecture room will also measure two hours for this lecture to last. You don't expect different numbers. We will find different numbers, and it's all because of this. The first postulate, the second we are not going to need for this example. Let's see what happens. Um, I want to calculate how much time this process takes as seen by the guy at the track. I have to be consistent with my colors here. 
Let's call that the, uh, the track time. Now we have to do a little bit of calculation, but not too hard, because what we have to do, we just have to do the same thing as here. Let's measure how much distance this light ray has traveled, divided by how fast it was going. That's exactly what we did here. But you can see that it has to travel two distances. It has to go all the way upwards and all the way downwards. Already you can see that the number will come out bigger than before, because mm -hmm. if this is already L, then this is going to be more than L. So whatever you expect to come out of this calculation will be more than 2 times L over C. It will be 2 times L plus something over C. You already see time dilation happening. Let's, let's, let's see what that number is. Well, let's split it up in two parts. Part one is, uh, it goes to the mirror. How much distance does it have to travel? The blue red light ray from lamp to mirror. So it consists of two parts. This is from lamp to mirror plus when it is here it still has to go back that's uh, mirror to lamp we expect it to be the same number yes yeah. if the velocity is constant if the velocity is constant it will be the same number i might have well would have could have said two times that number but sure okay so what distance does the light have to travel from here to here pythagoras we yeah. can use pythagoras theorem mm -hmm. Because we want to know this distance. This is what it has to travel. Mm -hmm. And let's make a triangle out of this. Right angles. This is L. How much is this? The velocity of the train divided by the time. time. Mm -hmm. Well, it is a velocity of the train because this is how much the train has moved in the mm -hmm. meantime. How much time has passed from here to here? Delta T divided by 10. Oh, which T? Delta, delta T. Uh, this one? Yeah, divided by 2. Oh, but that, but no. that, that is not measured in our system, is it? Mm, right. no. yeah, and it, 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 maybe it's the same number, but maybe it isn't. So we're not free to just randomly say, you know what, let's take his, this guy's time. Especially if you know where, what's coming. Delta T track. Sorry? Delta T track divided by two. Exactly. Thank you very much. The amount of distance that this has traveled is a velocity times the amount of time from this moment to the next. Yes. Now, how much time is that? Well, it's exactly the amount of time that it, that the the light ray takes to go from here to there. Mm -hmm. It's just this number again. Agreed. Yeah. So it's delta T lamp to mirror. Somebody mentioned over here, well, this number is really just half of that number. That is also true, but we will find it as we go along. Okay, so that means we are now uh, in the position that we can just write down what this number should be. So well, let's do it in blue. Because if you look at the picture, you can see we were wondering what this distance was. It's going to be L squared, Pythagoras theorem plus this number squared lamp mirror and then a square root that's this distance mm -hmm. Pythagoras theorem uh, but we now have a distance and what we wanted to have is the amount of time that it takes isn't V also to the power of square root to this uh, yes thank you very much yes you might have seen <coughs> that I rarely if ever use powerpoints and it's, uh, it's it's for this immersion thing i want everybody to think along and you can see that w because i'm doing it as i go along like clicking through pictures it's just me saying look this happens and that happens that you can see me do it and you can also see me make mistakes so thank you very much this should be a square okay this is a distance this distance how much time does that take if you want to convert this distance to a time Well, you have to divide it by something. I have a distance, I want a time to come out. I divide it by, well, by a speed. The speed with which the light goes. What speed is that? C. Note that we are now smuggling in this postulate, yes? Because we're saying that even as seen from the track, 
the red coordinate system, it will still go with the same number c. Here exactly is where the difference is with Newtonian physics, where this possibly is not true. If this were non-Einsteinian physics, what would you have put here, if not c? C plus v. C plus v, yeah. exactly. Because the light would have gone with respect to the card, plus how fast the card would have gone, and the total amount would have seen c plus v, agreed? But the fact that I'm not writing down the plus v here is exactly that postulate. That the speed of light is the same, even though I'm now in a different reference frame. That's the idea. Now, this then should be equal to... this number. There we go. And we're now in a beautiful position because we have an equation that tells me what this number should be, half of the number that we need, but it's still expressed in terms of itself. There's no issue there, you see that, right? It's just very basic math. So let's pry out that number. Suggestions? Should it be too hard? Well, let's do that, yes. So, as a little side note. Let's uh, multiply both sides with c, so we get rid of the c that's over here. Mm -hmm. Let's multiply that, then it's square both sides to get rid of the square root. I would end up with same expression, just rewritten a little. I would end up with this number. I would just get that. Well, that's easy enough. And I wanted this number, this here, so what I could do is just say, you know what? While I'm writing this out, and of course everybody has no difficulty <coughs> seeing what I'm doing here, yes? Um, one of you asked me, before we started this course, in the last couple of days, is pressure relativity hard? I said, well, mathematically it's not very hard. Because this is like the 15-year-old high school student math, yes? It's not going to be a lot diffi more difficult than that. It's the conceptual part that's going to be difficult. All right. And, of course, having said that, I shouldn't make any mistakes right now. So. <laughs> 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 and I was just about to make one. Um, this is going to be c squared minus v squared equals l squared. Still agreeing? Okay. And that means that v delta t lamp mirror squared is going to be L squared over C squared minus B squared. I, I am now going to take the square root and then I'm done. Now the reason that I put the square part in is for a reason. Because as you know I'm going to take the square root which gives me L over C squared minus B squared square root. And uh, notice that uh, of the two roots that I could have taken, the square root of 4 is, uh, is 2, but it's, it's also minus 2. Agreed? Mm -hmm. So math tells me there's two answers here. I took the plus answer. Any idea why? It's time, I guess it's time. Because it's time, yes. Of course, I could devise a theory where all these square roots just come with a minus sign. I would end up with a very interesting world. <laughs> I'm not being fetishist. I mean, there, there is a point here. And that is that if you had followed the maths, then these positives would have allowed you to have taken the, the negative route. The fact that I take a positive route it seems very logical to everybody, and it is. But if there's one thing you might want to pick up from the history of physics is that things that you thought were logical might not be very logical. Maybe there was a minus a sign and nobody ever noticed. So that I'm taking a plus sign here is really just a, an, an additional assumption, if you will. <laughs> Namely, the time that, that whatever you do, if you go from one reference system to the next, time will not start running backward, is what I'm saying here. I went to a different reference system, and time is still flowing forward. There's nothing in the two postulates that says that that should happen, so it's really a sort of separate postulate that I'm putting in. One that agrees, but then again, what you think agrees in physics and that doesn't always agree. Yes? Could then only use like time square instead of like normal time. So instead of like comparing yeah. everything in terms of time, you could compare it in terms of like time to the power of two. 
and we don't have that problem to. I agree, as long as, but uh, that is true. But notice that you're smuggling away your, your ambiguity in the plus minus signs by taking the square everywhere. And if I want to measure by looking at my clock, mm -hmm. uh, I will have to take the square root at some point. Right? Anyway, it's not a big point, but I did feel like emphasizing it. So what we have now is that we know this amount of time. There you go. Now we can do we can play the same exercise again and also calculate this thing. So that's this part, but it's the same triangle, isn't it? And as long as the velocity is constant, again, you don't have to take it as a constant, but for our exercise, we take it as a constant. Um, then this distance will not have be will not be different from this distance. Therefore, same exercise, same number comes out. And this, of course, is what you already said. It's just twice this number that will come out. So, long story short, having gone through the maths and having explicitly used this first postulate, you would get out this number times two. Uh, c squared minus v squared square root. So this is what the train track reference frame tells you what the amount of time is for the process. And this is what the cart reference frame tells you what the time is for the process. Uh, these are different numbers. This is exactly what we already were alluding to, that at some point you will have the time will flow differently for different people. Otherwise, you cannot have that both people will measure the same number. But now we're in a position that we can quantify this. How is the number different? So we, let's connect this number to that number. And let's see if we can make this, this one formula out of this. Um, hmm, what color should I make that? Because it's going to be there combined. Green. Green. Sure, why not? Let's go for green. Okay. Let's go for green. All right. Um, well, uh, here's the thing. Let me take one more step in red. I can rewrite this if I want as 2L over C uh, times 1 over 1 minus V over C squared. Same expression, just rewritten slightly. This is mass. You see this, right? And if you want to get this c back into the square root, you have to square it. Mm -hmm. Then you multiply it underneath what's under the square root, you will get this expression back. It's really the same thing. But notice that this part, the part that I put now in front, 2L over c is exactly the amount of time that would have passed as seen on the cart. And that's good news, because that allows me to eliminate this thing and put back into it this number. And this is where the green comes in. So what I have is that um, the delta t track is equal to well, this number, where this number is really just this number. So it will give you t uh, part. And then there's this factor in front. And there you go. That is the relationship between the amount of time that you see pass in the cart frame and in the track frame. These are not the same number. When is it the same number, by the way? Can you tell? The Just by looking at the maths? When phi is zero. Mm -hmm. Right, because if V is zero, then it just says one over one. Mm -hmm. Then it just says, oh, the amount of time is the same for both. What if the car is traveling in stream? Oh, now then we get to do deep waters. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what you were alluding to before. Well, you cannot really go with the speed of light. You can already see it happening here, yeah? Question is, what happens if, if V is the speed of light itself? So this cart is by itself moving with the speed of light. Uh, crappy things like happen. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you get infinity. Uh, this is not a proof, but it is a suggestion that something interesting happens with the at the speed of light. They don't experience time. Uh, uh, that is uh, that is not just philosophy. This is physics. That the amount of time that would be measured by the other guy uh, is zero. We will get there when we move on to 
uh, more examples in the next weeks, okay? Yeah, yeah, this is exploding, this is exploding mind moment, yes? Uh, how about I make it a little bit easier for you uh, by just saying, you know what? Maybe this says that this can never be C. Cars cannot go at the speed of light, you never get into your mind blowing issue. <laughs> now, this is not a proof, it's just a suggestion that at this point, the physics seems or the mathematics seems to imply that apparently cars cannot go with the speed of light. I haven't proven it. Later on, in uh, uh, the sixth of these uh, series, I can also do it in the fifth, but I think it's going to be in the sixth, I will show you what the real reason is that it doesn't work. And I'm going to show you in two ways, but you have to wait for that. The suggestion, though, is correct. This cannot go with the speed of light, but no, the answer is not because then your mind will get blown here. There's, there's different reasons. <laughs> okay. Now let's look at this for a moment. It is, of course, extremely obvious why, if V is zero, you would just get delta T track is delta T cart. Yeah. Right? I mean, if the thing is not moving at all, you're really just in the same system, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Okay? So you would expect that to happen. Um, the good news is that uh, even if the cart is moving, so V has some velocity, I have no idea how fast the train goes, but 200 kilometers, no, that's probably too much. But it's 50 kilometers an hour or so? Yeah, it depends on the train, and uh, there's bucket boosters, and yeah, that's true. I had to go to uh, Italy once for a conference in March of this year. I was on a train. It went with about 10 kilometers per hour <laughs> <laughs> because of, it, it got broken uh, on, on its way there. Mind you, I was on my way to the airport. It, it got worse because it was going very slow, ladies and gentlemen, uh, 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 there's something wrong with the train, uh, so, as, uh, so we're going a little bit slow, and then half an hour later, we're going very slow, and me getting more and more worried because my, my plane would leave at some point. Uh, they said, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the train is still broken, so we decided to go back to Maastricht. <laughs> <laughs> but with this velocity still. <laughs> no, this happened. I mean, I, it's very funny now, uh, but when I got back to Maastricht two hours after I had left, <laughs> Having made no progress whatsoever, I had, I had to take a taxi to Eindhoven to, to catch my flight. Consequence, 200 euros. <gasps> Having arrived there, they said, well, sorry, sir, you're very late. The plane's about to, to leave, uh, so we're going to give you some penalty of another 50 euros. I said, oh, that, that, that's nice. <laughs> I, did, I did get on the plane, by the way, and it arrived at Pisa, so everything worked out. Uh, of course, you call up the, uh, the, 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 the train services and they say, well, uh, we never promised you we'll be, the, we'll be there on time. We just promised you we will get you there. <laughs> and I said, well, you didn't, but they didn't, <laughs> didn't budge. Anyway, so if things go, uh, we're talking about speeds of trains, okay? So uh, what you see here is that if V is some number, the number has to be quite big in order for this factor to make any substantial change. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, you know the speed of light, it's about uh, 3 to the power, uh, 3 times 10 to the power 8, and you have to square it too. So it's 9 to the power, 9 times 10 to the power 16, mm -hmm. which is about 10 to the power 17 close. So that means that V has to be in the order of magnitude of 10 to the power 17 ish, a little bit less, 16 ish, in order for this number to be somewhat sizable. Uh, th that's well, not v. V squared has to be, mm. and that means that apparently this effect is going to be extremely small, because if v is a small number compared to c, then the square of their ratio is going to be a very small number, and it just says one divided by something that is very close to one, and you won't see the difference. Now you can make that explicit. This thing here, we have given a very special name. We call gamma. And it's a function of v, the velocity. It's got the Lorentz factor. Named after, after Hendrik Anton Lorentz, first Nobel Prize winner in the Netherlands, 1902. Not for this discovery, by the way, but for the Zeeman effect. Ask Jacob for details. And if you would make a drawing of what gamma looks like as a function of v, it would look typically like this. It will be one mm -hmm. for small velocities, and only when you get close to C is where it starts to rise upward. For the longest time, and by time I mean the longest amount of range of velocities, it will be extremely close to unity. In other words, the train as, as measured on the track will be just about the same as the, 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 the time measured on the train. Almost no difference. Of course, it's exactly the reason why nobody knew about this thing. Why everybody thought, 
one delta t is the other guy's delta t. It's because the difference only starts appearing at the moment that you go really, really fast, and nobody had trains who went that fast. So this is what comes out. And again, there's a barrier here in phys uh, mathematics, what is an asymptote? Mm -hmm. And yes, it is a suggestion that something interesting happens at the, at the moment that you go with the speed of light, that the cart would go with the speed of light. So this is what happens. This is the derivation that you see in typical books. Any questions so far? It's quite straightforward, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Is yeah. there a difference if I will run with some speed ah. the train? Uh, you might remember that in uh, lecture three we're going to talk about paradoxes and you can ask the question well if one guy's time is going to be gamma time shorter than the other person's then how about the other person's with respect to the first do you see the difference do you see the question there kind, yeah. suppose that i do something here and i'm not talking about a light clock here something, I'm just thinking about something to do. I'm, thinking, I'm going to take a sip of my coffee, okay? Right. Sip, that's a delta T. It took me a second or so. You measure how much time it took me. By the way, is that a smaller or bigger number? You see me sipping the coffee, does it take more or less seconds as seen by you? More. No, less. Yeah. Less. Less. less seconds or more, which one is it? Should be more. Same, because we're both in the same reference. Oh, no, no, I'm moving. Excuse me. Oh, oh sorry. No, so, so she and I are moving with a relative velocity of V, yes? Yeah, I only have limited space, so I stop moving. But <laughs> Okay, so here we go. I take a sip of my coffee. It takes me one second. Sip. Which of the two delta T's is that in my example? So delta T cot. That's delta T cot. Yeah. That's the amount of time that it takes me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How much time does it take her? Not the number, is it bigger or smaller? Basically yeah, bigger, bigger. bigger, okay. So what does that mean? How does it look for her when she sees me sipping the coffee? Slow it's motion. Slower. Slow motion. She sees me taking the sip and for, as seen by her, well, depending on the value of gamma, or if you will, our relative velocity, she will, suppose I run really, really fast while taking a sip, okay? <laughs> suppose I've taken already so many sips that I go really fast. <laughs> then you measure. <laughs> Then you, then, then you see me take the same sip and be running very fast. The gamma factor happens to be the number four. Then you see me take the sip in four seconds. Now, to go from this to this, you see me, th you see me move in slow motion. You see me sip in slow motion. So t this is what this this effect is called time dilation. But what if you go at the speed of light? Are you going to be traveling the moment? Um, well, that is interesting. <laughs> we already we already agreed that I cannot go with the speed of light, and yeah, I will prove in some. <laughs> sure, okay. Let's go. Oh, let's let's suppose that we can. Okay, let's be. <laughs> let, let's play around a little bit. Okay, so I go with the speed of light. So this is C. Then you never think this. Uh, exactly. She would see me be frozen in time. Because uh, this will, be, will become 1 over 0, which is infinity. infinity yeah. And that means she would see me take my sip in an infinite amount of time. So uh, let me you demonstrate an infinite amount of time. Forever, that's <laughs> 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 okay, so that's the idea. So if you see me move with the speed of light, again, you can't, for reasons I will show you later. Um, you would literally see me as frozen. Not my motion, because I would still go with the speed of light. You would see me move. But you, everything that you see me do while moving, it's going to be infinitely frozen in time. But you're still in you're No, no, but for me it's just one second. Yeah, yeah. So, so imagine what I see when I look at you. You don't see her. Why wouldn't I see her? Because she's too quick. It's the opposite. If, well, she, if she kind of see you no, freeze, see, no, you don't okay. have time to see her yeah. move. Like, or do oh, but remember, I don't, I'm not, for myself, I'm not frozen. I, I take my sip in one second. No, but if you look at her and you move too quickly. Yes. So it, the time should be like almost instantaneous, like, but it'd be opposite. She, she'd take the step like so quickly that you don't even like. That's right. As seen from me, I would see the whole universe, and that includes her, all of it happen in one instant. So, so, so here's a mind blowing moment again. Yeah. If you go with the speed of light, uh, you, 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 the, you, well, you won't see stuff, that's one thing, but, but everything that will happen ever in the universe will happen on exactly the same moment in time. 
Now again, be fortunate that you cannot go with the speed of light. So think about these four photons who so have to experience everything at once. So that's the, uh, that's the crappy thing. But for your reference frame, yes. she's going with the speed of light. Yeah. Ah, there's a paradox. Yeah. And we're going to discuss that in two weeks from now. But there's a good question. Now, I want to move on, but just to uh, make a point that he's making, and he's very right about that, I might as well say, well, wait a minute, who says that I was the person moving? I could could have well said that I was standing still and she was moving in the opposite mm. direction. Sure, I wouldn't see her legs moving, but maybe the whole classroom is moving in that direction, okay? Then I would say, no, it's her time that's going slower, and here's a paradox. Because I say that her time is going slower, she says that my time is going slower. Which one wins? And this is, of course, the paradox we will discuss in week three. But isn't it solved by the second postulate? I mean, we don't care. We just say, okay, it's just like the, the ah. one in regard of the other. No, the, 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 the second postulate simply says that both of them should be allowed. But you do see that different outcomes come. So, And you cannot have different outcomes for the same experiment. So something has got to give. There's a subtlety there, and this is the paradox. So leave that for now. For now, what I want you to remember, and it's very important that you do this correctly, so if you do want to make a note, now might be the time. Um, one thing that typically goes wrong when people apply this formula is they don't, that they apply it in the wrong way. Some guy's time and the other guy's time, and there's a gamma in between. Who gets the gamma is the question. And it's, well, you can already tell by the example, but let's make it very explicit. Erase this again. And I'm going to, again, make it explicit. The person, and by person I mean observer, I don't mean somebody with the conscience, the observer, let's call it that. The observer who sees the two things happen at the same location, that is the person who should be standing here. I'll explain in a moment, let me write it down first. This, this is the duration. as measured by the observer, or if you will, by the reference frame. I use these things uh, uh, synonymously. By the observer who sees the beginning and the end of the process happen at the same location, for whom it happens at the same location. Can you see that in my example with the train here, by the way? And by location, I literally just point, uh, mean the, the point in this guy's reference frame. Remember, there was a guy who drew with a, with a bucket of paint a coordinate system on the floor of the cart. Note that this guy in black, the guy who measured this, has seen the beginning of the process, the setting out of the light ray, and the, go the coming back of the light ray has happened to him on this particular point in his card, in his reference frame, it has not moved. Okay? We can actually make it explicit. In his coordinate frame, here's one, here's two, here's three, here's four, here's five, here's six. Notice that when the light was sent out, he reads out where, his, where the location was where it happened, it was location four. By the time it got back, the lamp was still at location four. That is the criterion to tell you that this guy's time is this one. Now this guy, the other guy's time, is the observer for whom the two events do not happen at the same location. You can tell that, it's, that it happens here, because let me draw for a second my coordinate frame in red again. The red coordinate frame had number one here, two here, three here, four here. It started at four, but as the train moved along, by the time it got back, the end of the process happened way beyond problem point four. Different location in his coordinate frame. That guy's time should be here. This is how we derived it, so this, have to, this is how you have to apply this formula. Let me write it down. Duration as measured by observer uh, who, see, who does not see begin and end of process at the same location. 
If there's one thing that goes wrong with people who apply this formula, is that they put the gamma in the wrong place. And this is how you know where to put the gamma. Okay? But if we get rid of the mirror in the card and yes. we consider delta t to be uh, from the lamp yes. to the very good seat. So let's your 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 suggesting is you know what let's let's take the, the clock or duration or over unit of time let's not take it back and forth just yeah. the fourth yeah okay then you cannot use this formula at all mm. Mm. and this actually relates back Rodrigo to you because at some point. You mentioned Lorentz transforms. Remember that? Yep. And you and then I asked you the question, Lorentz transform. Well, you told me Lorentz transforms tell you how much time occurs between for a process as seen by one guy and the next guy in different coordinate frames, reference frames. And then I asked you, but we already have a formula to connect these two things. This this one, yes. The Lorentz transform you can apply even when the amount of time is not or the process is not happening at the same location for either of the two observers. So this formula is very special. You can only use it if at least one of the two observers sees beginning and end at the same location. If none of them do, this whole formula does not work. You have to replace it by a different formula. These, these are Rodriguez Lorentz transforms that we will derive next week. So it's only a very special case. So your example where you say, well, let's take the clock to only go upward, then the derivation doesn't hold, and this formula doesn't hold. And we have to have a different formula. Does the uh, speed of light doesn't work because it wouldn't just reach the mirror? Sorry, one more time? It probably wouldn't just reach the mirror if the card goes with the speed of light. Oh, no, that is, okay, that is a separate, well, I wonder, I, I understand the question, your comment. I have to think about that for a while because <coughs> the first postulate says that what you mean is it, it gets tilted or something like that, right? Yeah, like it just yeah. wouldn't reach the mirror. I know, but it would still, first posture, it have to go at the speed of light in that direction. I have to think about it, but there might be an issue there. But since the overall speed won't be changed, so whatever, it won't be deformed like independently. Yes. So it will still reach, if you are at least in, inside of the courts, yes. it will reach it. But no, if you're outside, you, it might not reach the mirror. Well, there's actually because then the yeah. the slope will be like very very steep, almost like that way. Oh, if you have the angle, yeah, yeah. it will be almost like a straight. Ah, line. okay. But now you have to be careful. This is the subtlety there. Um, we're talking about what if the cart is going very close to the speed of light. Then, in order for the light ray to hit the, uh, the, the 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 mirror, it has to have a very small slope, right? Because the cart will have moved such a ridiculous amount that in order for the thing to get there. It has to slow very gently upwards. And if you go with the speed of light, you would think, oh, it, go, it, it li just lies flat. This, I think, is, is what you were thinking about, yes? And then wouldn't it also depend on the, on the height of the curve? Well, the nice thing about this derivation is, as you can see, the height uh, dropped out. So apparently, whatever oh, yeah. comes out is, yeah. is independent of height. And uh, in fact, that bridges uh, to the next part, what I want to talk about, because I promised you I would discuss with you uh, but then it also depends whether the cart is on the planet or whether it's like on what? a huge flat thing. Uh, how's, how's the planet involved? Because of curvature? It's curved space? Curved surface? Yeah. If it's curved, we just change the speed. If the speed is no constant, we just mm -hmm. change the speed the way we did. So instead of V, Will have like you will be dependent of the on different time because each time we if it's bent each time the speed will change like a direction so it won't be the same value yeah, yeah but there but the, yeah. but the light won't change its <coughs> it will be still a straight light yeah, yeah but yeah, light follows light follows geodesic around because you don't add the speed of light will be the same so you don't add the speed like that you turn yeah i'm not trying to add anything I feel an exam question coming up. This is a nice <laughs> question. Yeah. So, okay. so instead of having for me, instead of having V which will be like that and that, if we the V uh, V isn't a straight line that like that, the angle won't be uh, the angle between L uh, and uh, V won't be uh, like a rectangular angle. It will be uh, like bigger. 
ten ninety Only degrees. Only the trajectory of the train will be like this. The and V, the because will be like if I just see V as like the direction of your speed, if it doesn't go in a straight line, if it's if it at, uh, if it wasn't a number but a vector, like if it goes like down, for example, if it goes down, then the try the. Yeah, the distance that you you traveled is more. Uh, I don't know how to. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's. Uh, we'll have a straight. Just to be sure, the situation that is now proposed has very little to do with relativity per se. Yes, it has to do with the circumstance in under which you want to measure your relativity. You now, of course. The formula then. Uh, uh, yes, exactly. But now this is exactly bridging where where I want to end with today during the main lecture. I promise you, I will give you a derivation, but I will also tell you where the drawbacks are, and what we're doing now is exactly one of the major drawbacks. It's not so much per se that the, that the track is, it's, if you're very clear about on, on the curved surface. The issue is that if you would change the details of your experiments, your formula might come out different. Okay? Uh, uh, the, the way that I usually present this is suppose that you would do the whole experiment underwater. Now, regardless of how you put the light on the water and it gets refracted and such by the medium, etc., forget about all those details. It's all true, but it's not what I want to focus on. Underwater, you know that the speed of light is a different number altogether, mm -hmm. right? And that means if you would just follow through the derivation, you would get a formula like this with the wrong speed, with the wrong c, the non-vacuum speed. But then all of a sudden, it, 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 it would give you the suggestion that apparently the amount of time dilation you experience is dependent on, on the situations of your experiment. And it isn't. This formula is very general under the conditions that one of the two observers is standing still with respect to the beginning and end point of the process. Under that condition, this will always hold. Whereas the experiment gives you the impression that it only works for this particular example. Now, if there's one thing you will have learned from your liberal arts and sciences is that you cannot simply make an induction step, that you, can, that you cannot say, well, I've, I have this one example for which this holds, and therefore I'm going to assume that it holds everywhere in every other situation as well. Let's envision for a moment a universe in which light does not exist at all, let alone that it has these properties. Now, I just told you that the Dirac equation uh, will tell you that it does, but suppose that the powers that be have decided that the universe consists of everything except for light. Then this whole thing doesn't hold at all. I promise you that time dilation is still true in that other universe, even though there's not even light, let alone its properties to begin with. Now, this is something that I'm just saying right now without showing you the proof, and that will come next week. This is what I call the real derivation of these things. What I've done now is I've said I have one example for which this holds. Within that example, it's perfectly fine, but I'm promoting it to a general rule that apparently holds always. And this is not an induction step you are free to make. Einstein himself, when he wrote that 1905 paper, he took this exact example, but he was perfectly aware that this induction step cannot simply be made. So he makes an extreme point in really, if you, if you look up this article, it's in German, but there's English translations out there. He makes a very subtle, explicit point in making sure that you do not think as a reader that it's experiment dependent that you get these numbers out. And the way that it does is extremely subtle, we don't have time to go into it, but feel free to look it up. I will say one more thing, just, just so you have no idea how he does it. He says, if you're going to measure the amount of time, then you also have to take into account that you have to see the thing in order to make the measurement in the first place. And that means that uh, if you're standing over here while the cart has already whizzed by, it takes a certain amount of time before you see the measurement being done over there. There's another amount of lag in time there that has nothing to do with relativity. It simply has to do with the travel time that the light has before it reaches you. And Einstein devised this experiment in such a way that this travel time counteracts your idea that it might have been a light effect altogether. Now, again, it's an extremely subtle point. Unfortunately, when you read your typical books on relativity, they omit that point altogether. That you say, where's well, an example? We get a result, therefore it holds everywhere. And this is why I am not a particular fan of this example, but it does work. I mean, it's a beautiful didactical step towards this result, isn't it? But the idea is let's do it in more proper ways next uh, week. One more thing, um, and then we're going to stop for today and go to the tutorial in a moment. Um, 
note that I haven't specified how I measured the amount of time. And I said what the process was. I have not said how I actually did the measurement. I did not say, well, I put a detector here, or it's a photogenetic plate or something like that, or I put, some, I put my little brother there and let him tell me what, what the number is and shout it to me while the card came whizzing by. If you introduce all these effects, you will get all kinds of extra numbers and parts of this thing. It have nothing to do with relativity. It has to do with your measurement taking. And there is a misconception that you might pick up, and I want to be very explicit about that. This has to do with time itself. It has nothing to do with how you have measured the time. Okay? Final comment. Um, what if the train is accelerating? Doesn't it? Well, doesn't it? It's curved differently, so it could be more complex. You integer, maybe? Instead of, you, instead of uh, having... Thank you. Interested. Thank you. Um, this formula, we derived it for the case that the cart is moving with constant velocity with respect to the other person, mm -hmm. to the track. Now suppose that it is accelerating. You can already see that things will become much more difficult, yes? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Fortunately, there's a trick. We call this integrating. Because what is an accelerated motion else than just having constant motion, small amounts of constant motion, and every next moment in time the constant motion is a little bit faster, and a little bit faster still, and a little bit faster still. By good approximation, you can say that the first small amount of accelerated motion is, by good approximation, is a, is a constant velocity, for which this holds, with a certain amount of v. The next moment in time, the v will have increased, but then it, you can still approximate it by a constant velocity, it's just with a bigger constant velocity. Again, this formula with a bigger number for v, and you do this for every moment in time, and you want to have the total effect, you add all these extra moments in time. Now you know from your calculus this is exactly what it's called integrating. You take your function, add small numbers to its argument, and then you add everything up. Mm -hmm. So if you want to know how to apply this in case that things are not moving with constant velocity, you have an infinite amount, uh, amount of, of, of time. We call it little d, yes? Little d here. And you integrate it. So you can use this formula also when the car is accelerating. And there you go. Does the acceleration need to be constant? Uh, not necessarily, no. You can make V, as you can see, you uh, have to integrate over time. So as long as you know V is a function of time, in principle you can do the integration even if the V is a very complicated function of time. Okay. And there you go. Okay, so, um, tutorial. Now we're going to take a break, of course. The tutorial is, uh, we, are, we have a big group. So that means, in principle, we're split up, but the powers that be have decided, including myself, that I wanted to uh, have you both as in the tutorial group. Um, and that means that the tutorial on Tuesdays is going to be a joint tutorial that takes place here. On a Friday, you're split up, and I first have the first half in the morning, and then I have the second half. So I propose we meet, what shall we say, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, we convene here, do some exercises. Here. Okay, uh, I think it is here, or isn't it? No, it's at MBB. MBB. Okay, we'll move to MBB. Yeah.